Wonderful. So uh, I'm welcoming you to this exciting lecture tonight. And uh, it's going to be, of course, the topic that we all heard already many times. And so we are very fortunate to have Professor, Professor Caldwell from Rice University who will give an in-depth, very thorough lecture about what's really going on in Ukraine. So uh, again, it's a great pleasure. I'd like to acknowledge our guests. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Hughes, who is the Board of Region uh, member. So welcome. welcome. We're glad to be here. We're glad to be here. Also, we have uh, Dr. Matthew and Dr. Patterson, the Vice President. Uh, and of course, we welcome all of you. It's uh, we're very glad to see you here, and uh, hope you'll enjoy this lecture. And again, you'll, you can have, think of questions to ask uh, because it's a good time. And also, don't forget the cookies are um, right there. So and punch as well. So give some extra energy. So uh, so we'll, let me uh, welcome a professional uh, Professor Caldwell, who is a well accomplished scientist uh, and wrote five books at least, right? Uh, five books and uh, award-winning uh, professor in teaching. Uh, so again, it's very, very fortunate to have you. You have many, many accomplishments that I, I probably don't have time to go for all this because uh, I know everyone is excited to hear your lecture. So please, Professor. here can you hear me no no okay then I'll hold it like this can you hear me yeah. okay uh, and Anudas, thank you very much for introducing me thank you for inviting me it's great we were talking right before about teaching how I care about teaching my Anudas cares about teaching this is actually coming out of teaching two reasons it's coming out of teaching one is that we had nobody at Rice campus who was an expert in either Ukraine or Russia I personally am a German expert that's what I, I do uh, but somebody had to talk to our students about it, so I offered a course this semester, and I've been reading all summer trying to get the damn thing done. In any case, it was, um, it's been great. That's the first thing. The second is, in teaching, I sometimes set goals which I know I can't reach, and I know the students can't reach, because what are we trying to do? We're talking about hard problems, real problems. Real problems aren't easily soluble or understandable. So, for example, I do a course on World War I, why did World War I begin? And in fact, there's many theories, and people are arguing now it will probably never end. We won't exactly know why it began. In this case, we know why it began. It was a war of choice, and the issue is a little bit different. Why make that choice? And that's really what I want to talk about today. So my presentation today is both about the war that started in February and seems to have no easy end, and I think more important about different ways of thinking about why war begins. It's not obvious there had to be a war. Between the end of the Soviet Union and the invasion of Crimea in 2014, there were over 20 years of peace. If you have peace, you don't start by saying, oh, why was there peace? Why was there a war at this particular time? That is actually not as easy to answer as you might think. In early 2022, the Ukrainians didn't think war was coming. President Biden told President Zelensky war is coming, and he said, no, it's not, until the very last minute. The Ukrainians themselves didn't think that Russia would be so rash as to start this war, and yet Russia did. So I'm going to talk about four ways of approaching the coming of war. The first has to do with what happens after an empire breaks up, right? Once you have the Soviet empire end, what possibilities for crisis arise? Second has to do with NATO. Is NATO a threat? Is it a response to NATO? The third has to do with sources within Russia. Maybe the source is something else. Maybe it's an unstable Russia that's causing well, very, as I said, rash and scary actions in the world. And then leading to what is Putin himself thinking, something we will actually never know. That's the problem with history. Most things you will never know. What are the ideologies of dictatorship and ethnic nationalism and empire? which are guiding it. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. My main thing I want to start with, though, is to say this: none of these seem adequate to describe the war we're seeing. The war we're seeing, I like putting it to my students, is a, a shock, but not a surprise. And how do you put those two things together? 
A shock is not the same thing as a surprise. You can be shocked by what's happening and still say, you know, I, I kind of thought it was coming. This is a conflict that was developing over a quarter of a century, coming out of the breakup of the Soviet Union and the uh, maintain, maintenance of the borders which existed through the Soviet Union. They were carried on afterwards. That seems to have been one of the major roots of it. Again, it didn't have to happen, but it did. Tensions only increase after 2014 when Russia occupies the Crimean Peninsula of the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. We'll see, go ahead back there. Yeah, so you can see exactly the areas which, which are um, under question right now. By 2014, it was clear that Putin's Russia had designs on parts of Ukraine. The invasion that occurred was still a shock. Why? First, because it was a war of aggression. Let's explain exactly what we mean here. Ukraine might have been annoying, in annoyance to Russia. Ukraine might have been, uh, what, an, an example of a state doing things that didn't deal with what Russia was doing, especially democratization. Ukraine was not preparing war. To call this, as Putin did, an offensive invasion doesn't comport with the facts. There was no immediate threat. The Russian leadership launched an invasion with a clear intent of destroying the Ukrainian state and annexing territory. This is the definition of an aggressive war. This is a definition which is international law. Why is it in international law? Because the Soviet Union insisted it being international law during the Nuremberg trials. That's the irony of the thing, okay? So that's the first reason it's a shock. Second, it was clear this was going to be a horrible war. It would destroy huge parts of Ukraine, especially its cities. It would hit the population hard, even if Russia followed international law of, regarding civilians, and it hadn't in Chechnya, in its own territory, and it hadn't and doesn't in the Syrian civil war, both of which have been horrendous. The war has resulted in massive internal displacement. It's estimated that 7.5 Ukrainians fled the country, and 7 million others are internally displaced. We're talking about more than a third of the total population. Imagine that, people. 100 plus million Americans, either in Mexico or Canada, or displaced inside this country. This is really hard to fathom what this is about. Furthermore, more disturbing accusations have been made, actually, just in the last few days, the Department of State in um, uh, the US is uh, estimating that are between 1 and 1.5 million people may have been forcibly removed by Russians and relocated to Russian territory, presumably to provide for the labor that Russia itself has trouble providing. This is contrary to the laws of war that pre existed in Nuremberg and certainly contrary to what's happening, uh, what happened, at, so the laws that were accepted after Nuremberg. Um, it's a war crime. Reliable international organizations have also documented systematic cases of torture, rape, and killing in occupied area, areas may go beyond civil war crimes to be crimes against humanity. And we have proof. One of the things that Ukraine is doing very carefully is not investing in themselves, but bringing in UN and other organizations to do the investigation. They want it done slowly, they want it done accurately, they want to lay the groundwork for a potential trial. And what they're finding is that these are killings of civilians. Um, I won't go into details because um, we don't need to think about that right now. The justifications for war provided by Putin and his supporters are simply absurd. They're falsifying history. They're declaring a natural unity between Ukraine and Russia which doesn't exist. And I'm going to get into that more in just a minute here. They're accusing the government in Ukraine of being led by, uh, or determined, pushed by Western neo-Nazi conspirators. They're accusing it of being a fascist state. This is a state with a democratically elected president who's Jewish. They're claiming that Ukraine is preparing weapons of mass destruction without offering any proof whatsoever to show that they are. Fourth big point about why it's a shock, even before the war began, Putin started talking about the threat of nuclear war. Now, people, I don't know how long your memories are. This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. I say it a third time. It doesn't happen, not in my lifetime. You have this open threat of nuclear war. Most, by far, most nuclear weapons are controlled by Russia and the United States in this world. Okay? Russia has a huge number of them. The Soviet and the American leaders realized in the late 50s into the early 60s these weapons are not usable. Using them leads very quickly to potential end of the world. 
Okay, so it's a shock, and I say, not a surprise, what about this example of nuclear weapons? 2015, seven years ago, Putin had a military plane designed to carry a nuclear payload fly through the, or, 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 along England through the English Channel. It wasn't explicitly violating international law. No one knew whether it had a nuclear payload or not. These are the games he's been playing now for many years. So that also is not surprising. We got a lot of questions to ask them. What we are trying to do is look at these four different ways of explaining why the war began and then pull something together by the end. Why well, is that shocking word? Let's start with this basic fact, empires don't end easily. Empires don't like to admit they're no longer empires. I won't go through the examples, but think about Vietnam, think about Algeria. Similarly, every time a Russian empire has collapsed, and that's been three times in the last century, the issue of Ukraine and its relationship to the empire has been a problem. I have a complicated map here. Let's see if I can. What this is is showing the changing borders of Ukraine. I don't, you don't need to, there won't be a test. I promise. Okay. What I want to show you is what happened in the last hundred years. With the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917, am I getting this here? Can you see? No, you can't. Okay. Uh, in 1917, a new Ukrainian state formed, at first under the control of the Germans, then it became independent. It's 1917. That's this pink dotted line. When the, sorry, when the Bolsheviks were taking control after 1917, they thought Ukraine should come back in because Ukraine was a natural part of Russia. The Ukrainians didn't. Five years of civil war. After 1941, when the Nazis invaded and nearly crushed, let's admit it, really nearly destroyed the Soviet Union, they took over a huge chunk of Ukraine. And during that time, a lot of Ukrainians became collaborators with the Nazis. They say, oh my god, terrible. Yes, it was terrible. And there's a good amount of shame in Ukraine today. But it was in opposition to the Soviet occupation, which had just a few years before killed millions of people in a massive um, starvation. Uh, sorry, a mass, actually, it's a combination of stealing grain and not letting people leave, which resulted in millions of people dying. There's an argument about whether it was intended or not. With the Soviet Union, actually, it's kind of hard sometimes to tell because it was a pretty ruthless state. Certainly, though, there was great hatred. And what? has only become clear in the last quarter century is that the resistance to the Soviets continued until 1950 or 51. This is hardly talking about Ukraine and Russia being one. And then third, 1987-1988, Gorbachev is in power. And Gorbachev actually lets people investigate and talk about history. The Ukrainians begin talking about history, which is not incredibly nice history in the last hundred years when it comes to Russia. Very quickly, a nationalist and populist leader comes to the fore in Ukraine. Very quickly, he's saying, we really don't want anything to do with Russia. So my point here is we have a pattern. It's not one off, it's a pattern. Multiple times in a hundred years of Ukrainians saying, we don't want to be part of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Empire. This is not, uh, not something made up. Suddenly, this is a long-standing statement. This is not the same thing as Russia. Important to note, who actually destroyed the Soviet Union? I read the Soviet Union. It was actually three states within the Soviet Union. Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And they were all led by populist leaders, all led by leaders who didn't want the rule of the Communist Party, and they decided we to, to get around all the other problems, we're just gonna get rid of the Soviet Union. Russia was playing a leading role. So Russia is part of the end of the, this uh, uh, second empire we're talking about. What happened is, these three states were three of the four who signed the treaty in 1922, creating the Soviet Union. So in 1981, they said, we're gonna eliminate. Union. That's actually the story of, of, of how this, this great empire we thought was going to lead to war, blah, 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 didn't actually uh, lead the world to war, but in fact kind of just faded away. Now what's important here, when the Ukrainians did this, they had a referendum on December 1st, 1991. And people, I know you're thinking, why is he talking about referendum? Because this gives you a sense this is 
rated as free, no one's challenged it, of what people in Ukraine thought about Russia. These are the percentage of the, in the different parts of Ukraine and how they voted about having, having separating from the Soviet Union. Even in Crimea, which had the largest proportion of ethnic Russians, over 50% said, yeah, let's leave. Even in Donbass, 83%, that's a, a lot of ethnic Russians are there. The referendum said, we're gonna end the Soviet Union. This was a statement of the people. So, by the end of, the night, of 1991, the Soviet Union had no longer existed, the problem still did. The basic questions were there, go back to our little slide here. What's gonna happen in these areas with a lot of Russian, or ethnic Russians? Do they belong in Russia, do they belong in Ukraine? Here's the big deal, if you can start redrawing lines where there's ethnicities, and guess what folks, that's happened in Eastern Europe before, it didn't lead to a good outcome, right? If you, all sorts of groups always have, can challenge where uh, words can be drawn. What about the Crimean Peninsula where much of Russia's fleet is located? And not least, what about the nuclear bombs that both Ukraine and Russia have? President Bush and Secretary of State James Baker were both really, really worried about these bombs either falling into the wrong hands or there being a, a, a not a civil war, a war between Ukraine and, and Russia where both sides have a whole lot of nuclear bombs. This was not a dumb thing. I often like disagreeing with James Baker just because I don't like his building at Rice University. <laughs> not a good reason, okay? But he was so totally right about this. They put that on the agenda. They said, we have to, we have to do something to make sure we don't have a, a crisis a nuclear crisis here. With that, they pushed, and finally in 1994, 1994 it was realized for a memorandum, the Budapest Memorandum, extremely important. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in return. Russia recognized the existing borders, and that's cemented three years later in another treaty. Look, the Russian leadership, post-Soviet leadership, has now said twice they recognize the existing borders. That treaty was basically burnt up by Russia in 2014 when it invaded Crimea. That's why it was not approved, re-approved later on. Weirdly, Russia wanted to have it approved again, but Ukraine said, why? You've just taken over Crimea after 2014. So, here's my point, though. The messy breakup of the Soviet Empire clearly brings with it long-lasting strains, irritations. Do these tensions necessarily lead to war? If so, why only in 2014? Right? That's the problem. Why a quarter century later? The fact that the empire collapses doesn't do it for me. It's not enough. Indeed, Russia has earlier recognized Ukrainian borders, and as the deal, gotten Ukrainian nuclear weapons. That's a pretty good deal. Russia later accused Ukraine of engaging in genocide against ethnic Russians, again, without providing proof. There were some Ukrainian nationalists who wanted to restrict use of the Russian language. President Zelensky is actually elected on a platform of allowing them to keep their language. Now, he wasn't going to go all the way, but he was opposed to this kind of ethnic nationalism. In many ways, things are looking good if they're trying to protect ethnic uh, Russians. So I'm not convinced this first reason is sufficient. Let's turn to our second one, which I'm sure you have heard about, the NATO expansion. The expansion of NATO, is this actually posing an existential threat to Russia that would lead to a war that might involve nuclear weapons? Is it that serious? NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is a defensive organization, uh, most of Western Europe, now a lot of Eastern Europe. Uh, the idea behind it, it includes the United States as well, is during the Cold War, they would all provide a collective security agreement. If any one of them was attacked, the entire NATO organization would respond. Uh, it has, in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, only one time been used for an actual aggressive action, and that was a very special case in Serbia, um, which we can come back to later on. The point is, it's almost entirely in defensive alliance. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, in 1989, the question comes, hey, look, if, if the wall falls, uh, what is going to happen to East Germany? East Germany was part of the Warsaw Pact. West Germany was part of NATO. If 
The wall is going to fall, if it falls in 1989, the question is, is Germany going to become united? If it does, does that mean the NATO is going to be pushed to the east? James Baker, in February of 1989, sorry, February of 1990, February of 1990, he tells Mikhail Gorbachev, head of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, no, we will not move NATO, not one inch to the east. That's what he says. And yet, this is going to happen just a few years later. Here's the backstory. In February of 1990, it looked like the Soviet Union was going to survive. By summer of 1990, the other Eastern European states, part of Warsaw Pact, were pretty much saying no and leaving. By summer of 1990, the Baltic states were indicating very clearly they were going to leave the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was collapsing. At this point, arguments about what to do to ensure the Soviet Union not attack Germany if it expands eastward, they became moot. Gorbachev agrees to this first important expansion of NATO. In other words, he says, Germany, like all countries, has a free choice of alliances. That's the principle behind Gorbachev's decision here. Putin later will argue, he did already, but still um, at the beginning of, of 2022, that the US broke an agreement with Russia by allowing this initial expansion that's really simply not true. That's the, there's a lot of falsehoods that come out. There was no treaty. This was part of a negotiation process. An early point, it was spoken, it was not in a treaty. I hate to be legalistic with you. If you sign a contract because someone tells you something, hey, we're not gonna move one inch into your backyard, and they do it, you're making a mistake. You actually, you write it down in a contract. That's what a treaty is, the same thing. More important was the NATO decision in the late 1990s to allow Eastern European states like Poland to join. This marks a significant change in NATO policy. It was hard to resist this change for two reasons. One, historically, Poland was very nervous about Russia. Poland had been under control of Russia for over 200 years, except for a short 20-year period. They did not trust Russia. It's not the Soviet Union they distrusted. It's actually the Russian Empire before they distrusted. They had actually legitimate reasons to be worried about having some kind of protection. That's the first thing. And the second, it really matters a lot that there's a lot of Eastern European and Polish voters in the United States. And that Clinton was being pushed to the wall at that time. And he listened to them, as later George W. Bush did. It's important to remember also, as part of this discussion, Poland had lost its last with independence in 1939. Something happened in 1939, right? The beginning of war. This was a war that was agreed to by both the Germans and the Soviets. The Germans attacked Poland from one side, and uh, what was it about 10 days later, the, the Soviet Union attacked from the other side. I want to come back to that in a minute. It's an important moment that Putin is not, and you can go to jail for saying that, but everyone knows that it's true. That was the decision in 1939. And that means there was this, this abiding distrust in Poland. Now, notably after, uh, uh, really after about 2004, where you have some other expansion to, of NATO into Eastern Europe, it comes to a halt, which is also an interesting point. Why has it come to a halt? It comes to a halt because Germany in particular says, don't push it too far. We don't need to have border directly with Russia. That's not such a good thing. And in fact, this happens at a very key moment. In an earlier invasion, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, Merkel, the prime minister, or pardon me, the chancellor, goes actually to Georgia and says, no, we're actually not going to support you going to NATO. We stand behind you. But if the borders are under dispute, and we in NATO expand to these borders in Ukraine and Georgia, and there's an attack by the Russians, NATO will be forced to come in or give up its existence. So this was actually, a, I think, by 2004, or at least two, at the latest 2008, NATO expansion in a meaningful way is over. The only other signs of expansion until the past year have been down here, so further away from, from Russia. Uh, why does it matter? Because one of the main arguments made by Putin is that NATO represents an existential threat, and it's getting closer and closer. But the point is, since almost 15 years, that has not been happening. That has not been happening. So it's hard to take that seriously. The other side of this, which is an interesting thing to ponder, 
if an empire ceases to exist, are we required to recognize the borders of the old empire? Recognize them as legitimate territory that Russia should control? Uh, I don't think we get to that in, in other empires. I, why, would, why would that be necessary in the case? Necessarily the case. So let's pull it together. What do we have here? The expansion of NATO was quite possibly ill-advised. Even so, the cause of the war, I, I simply don't see it. This is a defensive alliance. It's a threat to potential Russian expansion, not a threat to the state. And the, uh, the expansion clearly stops at Ukraine's borders. At the end of 2021, fearing war with the intelligence he was getting, President Biden sent a clear message multiple times to the Russian leadership we are not going to allow NATO to expand into Ukraine. Just ignore it. And Zelensky also made that offer as well, uh, right before the invasion started. One weird result. Again, you have heard this, I'm sure, that NATO is the cause of this. The invasion had an interesting effect. Sweden and Finland had stayed resolutely neutral because they didn't want, again, a shared border with Russia that could lead to immediate conflict with all Europe involved, and now they are wanting and they're going to get NATO membership. If this was the aim of Vladimir Putin, he failed dramatically. He failed dramatically. Now, Finland is only, you know, not very many miles away from St. Petersburg, and now it's, it's been part of NATO. Okay, let's turn to a different topic. What if there's something in this Russian political and economic system which is leading toward instability? So we're not at war yet. How can we get there? Another way to get to war is by asking whether hmm, the structure of the state is tending itself toward instability and toward a need for some kind of expansion. Maybe there's something here that's, that's going on. Let's take a look at this. What happens in Russia over the 1990s? The development of increasingly centralized authority centered on the executive, in other words, authoritarianism, plus increasingly centralized control of the economy by a small group of oligarchs. And under Putin, that becomes even more systematic. The oligarchs, a, dozen, a little more than a dozen of them, they meet with him regularly, some every two weeks, some every four weeks. And these oligarchs who control things like oil or steel, when they're making big decisions, they clear it with Putin. So you see a very much a vertical system of power developing in Russia over the last, especially the last 22 years, or let's start before. Russia didn't have to take this path. Uh, it did. The 1990s in Russia were dominated by a single charismatic and yet tremendously problematic leader, Boris Yeltsin. He led the way to the Soviet Union's breakup. He pressed for an opening of democracy for the first time. He would create the institutions of the new Russia, but he was also the one who, by 1992-93, began to centralize executive power. In a conflict he was having, which is a bad conflict, right, with the parliament. The parliament, parliament was still elected, elected, quote unquote, elected from the olden days, from the Soviet Union. Um, he responded by bombing the parliament building. And after this point, he actually said, okay, here is a, a constitutional draft, the people will vote on it without parliamentary approval. He, displaced the parliament. And people, I say in America, um, the president's not the center of democracy, Congress is. Any place you go, a place with many voices is actually the, real, the reality of democracy, not a place with only one voice. And that's exactly what he was pushing aside. Meanwhile, the economy was in free fall. Elites stripped companies they sold stuff that the workers had produced and put in overseas accounts. Everyone knows this. Everyone knew that at the time. They hid money and they jockeyed for power, controlling ever more factories. Male life expectancy dropped at a rate that I don't know I've ever seen outside of wartime. Male life expectancy dropped in the 19, early 1990s by 10%, right? from 66 to 58. There wasn't a war. People weren't being killed. Russian men, especially, especially men, were killing themselves or drinking themselves to death. You can't get this was disastrous. And I 
you don't have time to talk about this much. This is a chart that should look basically like a dress. It's a population chart. What you see here, up there, the first, this is, these are the people who kill themselves, and these are children. You don't have enough people to reproduce this, this country anymore. You have a, a country that's failing demographically. We'll come back to that, because it's a little too detailed to, to go into much detail. In the 1990s as well, inflation hits. Inflation, the confidence is one that matters. Early 1990s, inflation of over 1,000% means that if you, and many of you are going to be in this position, if you or your parents have a 401k, or if your Social Security is not going to go up with inflation, or you are you saving money, it is gone. It becomes worthless. That helps explain why today, under extreme pressure, the, the um, the inflation rate in Russia has stabilized, despite the sanctions, at about 15%. That's acceptable for the people, certainly, who experienced this earlier period. They want stability. Stability is meaningful. It's probably going to change as a new generation comes in. Putin comes in after this period of the 1990s. He comes in initially as a problem solver. That's how people in the West think he's going to, they think he's going to do. He comes in with a background of the KGB which is, of course, this basically a, a secret police um, entity in the history of the Soviet Union. That's his real background. He's focused on power. If you're in the KGB, you would gather information often against the rules of the country, and you would also take people out, whether it means put them in jail or otherwise, against the laws of the country. That's what they did. Action over mere legal norms, right? That's his background. Uh, my, like many others in his generation, he was terribly disturbed by the collapse of Soviet power, which he witnessed uh, in Germany. Uh, and he basically says, where was the state in the 1990s? He is in St. Petersburg, which was maybe the most, one of the most corrupt, uh, not the most, one of the most corrupt cities in Russia at the time. He is a fixer. He gets things done. He comes to the attention of other people of, of Yeltsin. He is acquainted with the way money and the way power is intermingled, and Yeltsin basically anoints him as his successor. His authoritarian streak becomes very clear almost immediately. It comes clear in a uh, separatist part of Russia. He begins simply issuing presidential decrees. No one challenges him. He circumvents the other powers of the state. He's presenting himself as a reformer. He demands a dictatorship of the law. He says, we need rule of law here. By rule of law, he says, though, dictatorship. What is the first move to establish rule of law? Ensure you have the right judges in place. Judges will answer to the state. And the reporters, we just had a, one of the most famous reporters uh, who's dealing with this crisis right now, Masha Gessen, who came to speak at Rice University earlier this week. And they said, it was clear to reporters that Judges were ignoring procedure and ignoring rights and coming to the conclusion that was already decided on before cases, before cases actually started, when the cases were controversial. He, from the top down, was intervening in any controversial case that he wanted to, twisting procedure and so on. This was especially directed against ethnic minorities and, for the last uh, few years more, against uh, gays and lesbians. This system, I think, clearly reflects the beliefs of a KGB man that in the end, only the force of a strong man can solve a country's problems. It's well ingrained, actually, in, in uh, the recent history of the Soviet Union. The result of this is what Putin's people call managed democracy. And this develops over the first uh, decade of the new millennium. Laws are put in place. At first, they're just minor little changes in laws that make Ridiculous requirements for new parties, making it virtually impossible in a parliamentary system to found a new party. They keep unwanted candidates out of elections. The elections are manipulated by 2004. All the journalists are saying, hey, these are not real results. The media is um, managed, cracked down on journalists, which includes also, also already around 2004, a little before uh, the murder of some journalists, um, including some of the best known, like Anna Pelot. So that was Politkovskaya. I do German history, so I'm doing my best with the Russian pronunciation. But murder of journalists, which again and again, these murders, nobody seems to be there. They may be right in front of the Kremlin, nobody has seen them. The managed economy matters a lot. 
the big parts of the economy are under the control of the oligarchs. Outside economic experts have noted projects regularly cost much more money than they should. Where is the extra money going? And this is, I'm saying this, this is not a conspiracy theory. Eslund, who's a Swedish um, economist, has documented this again and again and again. The managed economy is skimming money off in the interest of a small group. And then there have been perpetual assassinations of regime opponents, probably the most uh, famous with the assassination of Boris Nemtsov in 2015. So here's the question. Why is this tendency to repression increasing? Why is this happening? It seems that Ukraine does play a role here. It seems that Putin is beginning to feel threatened by several things that happened in Ukraine and in Russia. In 2004, a candidate he supported the president of Ukraine was elected and there were clear violations of um, electoral laws. This was a faked election. The people went to the streets. Uh, popular post protest forced a redo of the election. It was admitted by outside observers, yep, this is not a legitimate election. The so-called Orange Revolution, in other words, forces a new election and Putin's candidate is not in power. The poor Russian candidate is not in power. This is the so-called Orange Revolution. This may seem like minor to you. This is the state that he considered like Russia. It should be like Russia. His elections are manipulated, and look what the people did over there in Ukraine. Just eight years later, 2011, 2012, there's an election which is clearly rigged. By this time, everybody knows the elections are rigged in Russia, but actually tens of thousands of people come out on the street. I am, um, these are the largest mass protests in Russia in decades, since, actually two decades, since right at the end of the Soviet Union. These were protests, I should be very clear, that happened in Petersburg and Moscow and a few other larger cities, there are protests, probably not of 75% of the population, but they are meaningful protests. These are protests of professionals and people who rely on the new economy. They wear little um, white ribbons. The security and military smashed the protests, the leaders went to jail. Now we get to 2014 and the invasion of Crimea, you remember that? The invasion of Crimea, why at this particular juncture? In 2014, that Russian candidate who lost out, right, look, Ukraine is a mess this whole time. I'm not going to say anything. They have actually elections where you have outcomes which are unpredicted. That, elected, that person who uh, was not allowed to come in in 2004, he does get elected. Um, I believe it's 2013. 2014, the Ukrainian parliament says they want to apply for EU membership. They want to be part of a dynamic, strong economy based on the rule of law with anti-corruption rules. And that leader, that president, Yanukovych, ignores them and begins talks with Russia about connecting the, the Ukrainian economy with Russia, which would mean connecting it with autocracy, which would mean connecting it with an oligarch oligarchy and with massive corruption. That's when you have this, the, uh, put it up here, in 2014, uh, the uh, great protest which actually throws Yanukovych out. Putin declares this in, an illegal coup by the West. I do sometimes feel bad for Hillary Clinton. He blames Hillary Clinton. Oh wait, Hillary Clinton did all the things she was blamed for. Boy, you gotta say, that's a superwoman. What it was, was actually massive numbers of people, numbering the millions, in Ukraine saying, no, we're making a decision for the EU, for the West, not for the East. So let's ask how we connect the system, the state system we got here with this war. And again, we're gonna run into some problems, but I think we can see at least some structural connections. I had to put this up here. <laughs> Guys, our friend Vladimir Putin, he got in the habit for some years of producing calendars of himself. I'm not kidding. To give uh, to the people who, you know, were yearning for what we might call Putin porn. Um, he's fishing, or he's got a gun, or he's riding a wild tiger, really? Or, uh, anyway, again and again, he's, he's, he's half naked. Anyway, I just had to throw that in there, sorry. Um, 
They care about you. Can we just say, thank goodness we don't have this kind of president in the United States? I mean, okay, I'll leave it at that. What are the consequences of a police state that's coming under pressure? That's our question. What actually happens in a police state with a very, very strictly vertical organization of power that's also controlling the economy? First thing that happens, extremely limited ability to reform. Because any reform is going to call into question some of those people who will have the power. Second thing, um, who is going to take an independent position of Putin? He's got ever fewer people he talks to. Are you going to challenge him? Some of the businessmen who challenged them got poisoned. In other words, we're seeing an echo chamber developing around Putin. I think we're also seeing someone, a leader, who can become more willing to take major risks to defend his position and the system he's set up. And I personally believe, we'll never know what he thinks. I think he thinks this is the only system that is adequate for Russia. It's not just about corruption. I think he truly believes he is the only man who can save Russia. And he's gonna try to save the world. Okay, so now we get to Putin. Sorry, I did have this, but see, the images are covered. I can't see this one. I, just, I know you want to know. Okay, we're turning to ideology and justifications. So it's really clear what I mean by like ideology. Oh my goodness, I've got two minutes left. Oh, two minutes over. By ideology, I don't mean your like religion or worldview. That's not what I mean. By ideology, a very specific thing, a way of understanding the world that justifies power. A way of understanding the world that justifies power. And he has been playing with ideologies justifying extreme power for some time now. Uh, he doesn't have to believe in them. He can simply say they're useful. But certainly, again, we can see the examples of Mount um, At the same time, he's suppressing public opinion. He's also bringing forward new ideas. What is the guy named Alexander Dugan? Dugan was a second-rate philosopher who got wrapped up in the change of 1990, read all this stuff, and gradually moved to the extreme right. He's been professing the mystical unity of Russia. He's been rejecting democracy on principle. Democracy tears apart that unity. Who wants political parties? Russia is unified. He demands that Ukraine be part of this natural spiritual unity of Russia, but be under administrative control, not have not elect its own leaders. He's been attacking, calling for an open violent attack against GLBT populations, against liberals and Democrats, and he's been defending a grand Euro-Asian fusion which would destroy the United States and its liberal decadence. That's what he's been saying at the same time that Putin, through uh, the 2010s, has been funding far-right organizations across Europe. He also openly embraces what he calls the positive side of fascism and Nazism. Uh, does Putin accept all of this? We have no idea. We do know that while other people are out there being kept from saying Simple things like it's a crime today to say that Russia is at war. Dugan can say what he wants. We do know that Dugan has been quoted by Putin in his speeches. And his uh, justification of the occupation of Crimea seems to have been taken in part word for word. That's why Putin's justification seems to have taken word for word from Dugan. Same thing with this man, Ivan Ilyin. Um, I won't go into the details. It's, um, Basically, he thought the best system in, in Russia would be to combine Stalin and uh, German Nazi youth organizations and nationalist organizations, whatever. Um, he's been forgotten, except Putin's brought him up in his speeches. And in 2009, Putin removed his bones and moved them back to Russia for burial. And then this is where I got his books. And where I started my own work 20 years ago studying this man, Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt has become vogue across conservative circles in Moscow in particular. He was a lawyer who made exactly these arguments against pluralism, against democracy in the 1920s in Germany and ended up being the main lawyer for Hitler. I'm not arguing that Dugan, Ilyin, or Schmidt has described an ideology that Putin's embraced. I don't think that's what it's about. 
What's important is their ideas dovetail with Putin's actions and allow him to talk a language which can get popular support. I think he believes in the need for a stable, powerful state under a single person. Putin has taken control of the public sphere. He's formed a bond with the Russian Orthodox Church, whose leader in Russia, Krill, Patriarch Krill, is a close ally of Putin, also former KGB. It's amazing to see how many people in Parliament and elsewhere are former KGB or uh, the follower of KGB. He's got this connection to the, the secret police, um, which has become politicized. He's given himself, in other words, a religious foundation. Back to our issue of 1939, he's banned comparisons of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. He's banned discussion of their uh, partnership in 1939. You cannot talk about that. He closed down this amazing history center called Memorial. I'm a historian, actually, I kind of like history, I like historians. Memorial was these people already before 1989 who were courageous enough to start actually digging into the archives and seeing what happened in the Soviet Union, who was in the camps, and so on who was carrying stuff out. So he's banned memorial, he's banned independent sources of information, including human rights organizations which have been revealing the crimes of Stalinism. His history aims to produce a positive picture of Russia with no uh, blemishes. Where are we? We have no single big answer to our big question of why this war. If we take all these explanations and put them together, we might be seeing something. We might be seeing a pattern. And that's what historians do, right? We're looking, there are very few smoking guns in history. There are lots of plausible patterns, and this is one. First, about the empire. Many in Putin's generation grew up assuming a Soviet empire, assuming an American enemy. So did Putin. When Ukraine rejected Putin's wannabe autocrat in 2014, it made a choice for the European Union not to be part of a renovated empire. That was certainly a major irritant. Second, I've argued that NATO is a bit hard to see as the cause of the conflict. Maybe it's an irritant, but not a cause. Even today, Ukrainian membership of NATO is not on the table, but maybe we're simply looking in the wrong direction. If you're looking at international organizations, is NATO really the key? You know, Finland is going to become a NATO, and Putin's not protesting? I think the key might have been the European Union. To be part of the European Union, you have principles of the rule of law, principles of democracy, principles of anti-corruption, which are actually enforced by our higher court. So international relations, I think, may matter, but in a different way, if you take seriously the first point, that is the third point, that you have an unstable police force, oh, sorry, police state, unstable, no, very stable police force, an unstable police state, and exactly what the EU might bring into Ukraine might have an effect the stability of that state and its ability to carry out what it's normally doing now, the different kinds of repressions. And then you do have these ideologies of dictatorship, ethnic nationalist redemption, which are ideologies about rebuilding an empire. Does he believe in them? I think probably not. Does he see them as useful for his project of empire building? I think so. I think, last not least, if Ukraine continues its pre-war cultural politics, which grants rights to marginal ethnic groups to try and create a unified nation that confronts Soviet-era crimes, that confronts anti-Semitism, even has a gay president, even has debates on full rights for gay people, uh, I bring these up because they're central to the discussion in Russia right now, right? What would this mean for an ideology that stresses the need for a managed economy, a managed democracy, and a managed society? I think by putting these things together, we get an understanding of why Vladimir Putin and his small group of oligarchs would make such a terrifying and terrible decision as this one to invade. Maybe somebody has a question. Yes. Yes, I just want your opinion. Do you think there's any chance of the oligarchs, uh, you know, initiating a coup? No. 
I, I think it's impossible. I think that Putin is so worried about this. You know, the long table with him sitting at the end, and they're like as far away as you are, right? COVID was actually really funny at that point. Yeah, he's, he's very worried about his health for a lot of reasons. He kept people away. And he, remember, he has this close connection with FSP, which is the follower of the KGB. The, those who have actually challenged him have gotten you know, a lot of trouble. That doesn't mean that his position in society is weak. We can get to that. That's a different thing. I don't think there's a threat of food. I don't think any of the population would want it either. They like the stability. Again, for reasons we can understand. Reality is just so long time. I'm sorry. Questions? More questions? Yep. Go ahead. Ukraine will not be accepted into NATO. They're applying to, they're applying to, but it's not going to happen. And certainly, if, if we, if the U.S. or Germany or any other countries immediately accepted Ukraine into NATO, all the other NATO countries would be obliged not just to supply arms, but to supply soldiers. And um, that's not on the board, partly because of the nuclear threat, but not just because of the nuclear threat. Now, let me actually rephrase this. I don't think that's an act of cowardice on the part of Biden and uh, the other leaders uh, who are participating in this. It's an act of realism. That's the first thing. And the second thing that's really important is, uh, I, I actually think, I didn't think this a month and a half ago, I think Ukraine, at huge cost to itself, could actually win this war. I know that's crazy, but I can't believe the changes that happened, like the change today, it looks like a truly a withdrawal from Kherson, which is a huge blow to Putin. If they can win the war themselves, admittedly with support, arms and stuff, talk about legitimacy. That actually helps them in the long run. And I, I think that you know, a little country beating a big country. Hey, are we not? Can we be opposed to that as Americans? Not really, right? So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing at all if they can really pull this off. Let's get back to the first question. Here's a scenario that came up in foreign affairs just this week. It's not a scenario of a coup. A coup is almost impossible to happen. But what if ordinary soldiers who are basically your father is age even older, right? What if they're going to war unprepared? They're not even given good guns. They're not given bulletproof vests. If they have them, their family has to buy them for them on the black market. Okay, that's what's actually happening right now. What if they, as they say, melt away? Just kind of see, don't fight. And melt the way, you can do that without getting in trouble because, you know, it's a pretty disorganized country. That's a different scenario um, if Ukraine keeps up this momentum, a different scenario because as a good friend of mine, an older uh, military historian said, he feels very sorry for the Russian soldiers who are finding out what they're really doing once they get there. So I'm not really answering your question at this point, but it's opening up all these things I want to say. Other questions? You had a question here. Oh, I had read that Ukraine controls a large percentage of, or produces a large percentage of the world's grain and oils, and I wondered uh, what part that might play in Putin wanting to take control of the power within controlling that much of the world's food sources. You know, I was thinking of that too. That is money, you know. The, Ukrainian grain helped fuel Soviet industrialization, which helped lead also, because it was being taken out of Ukraine, to the massive starvation in uh, 1932 33. So there's a long history of wanting to get that grain. On the other hand, folks, I don't know if any of you come from farming families, uh, you don't want to link your economy to grain. I mean, the economy, the current economy, is linked to high tech stuff. I think even oil is under pressure. It's not a reliable source over the long run. And this actually got me thinking when I was driving down here. Actually, I wasn't driving. I was stopping in a traffic jam. I was thinking, I hope nobody asks me about all those amazing resources that Ukraine has, because I can't think of any. This is the main resource. They're moving in a new direction with EU money to develop different kinds of high-tech industries there, because they have a pretty good level of education. Most of it has been destroyed. Um, that's where they're going. And they don't have platinum. And they don't have copper. So, in other words, I just don't know why you would want to invade Ukraine for their resources. I guess, does that make is, sense? Is there power in having that much control over the world's food sources? Like, yeah. 
sixty percent of uh, some countries get their their grain from Ukraine, and I've heard that that could cause a starvation event if Russia wanted that to happen. You got a really good point here, and that turns it around. I think that the control that the Russians are trying to exert now is exactly about that, but I think that's a wartime pressure. Otherwise, this is not a huge money maker, but it, 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 it does certainly, what they're trying to do is create disruption wherever they can now in the middle of a war, which is why they're trying to disrupt the grain production. But again, that's wartime, those are wartime measures. I don't think that's the same as saying, oh, thank God we have all this grain. But I take your point, I think it's a good point. Uh, one, two, three, that's some questions together, if that's okay? Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. I read a real interesting article that said that the Russian economy was on the verge of collapse and had depended on oil and gas, mostly gas sales to Western Europe for the capital it needed to continue to, to uh, exist. such as ports with the Crimea, as well as Donetsk. Last question. Absolutely, there's also the issue of the Crimea Peninsula, there's the issue of where the Navy is, there's the issue of Odessa. Two things. One, control those ports. If you don't get all of Ukraine, you keep Ukraine from having access to ports. They gave all the agriculture in the world, but they can't get it out, okay? So yes, although I think that's good, I think that um, they actually were not being, they were not likely to lose the Crimea naval yards, et cetera. But I do think that that matters as well. Oil, I've heard these different reports back and forth. Um, uh, certainly the Russian economy is under pressure. And certainly that has to do with oil. But luckily the oil price has gone up as supply has gone down. Um, I think over the long run, it's more interesting maybe than the media. Over the long run, those supplies are gonna be oriented eastward, especially in China. The Chinese are not stupid. They're not going to get those, that oil at a normal market price. And over the long run, this is where the oligarchs were, going, oligarchs were apparently going, oh my god, we're totally shocked when this war began. They knew there were going to be sanctions. They knew that oil deliveries to the West were going to be limited. And over the long run, the money coming in to the coffers of the Russian state, which Putin has used very effectively to stabilize the state. I mean, this is this is good technocratic decision. Whether there's an immediate collapse or not, I don't, I'm not sure there is. Over the long run, that source of stability is, is going to come into question. And then you have the question again about, uh, so the annexation. Annexation. So if you recall, when the annexation of, uh, let's go back to the back here. I do want to stop at Putin, I'm uh, sure it was Putin. <laughs> I just find that strange. I don't know. That's true. Okay, so we're talking about these four areas, uh, really 86, 83, 83, 90, those up there. That's really what the area we're talking about. It's a little different from that, but you get an idea of what it is, right? And the annexation included areas that were not under Russian control, which is kind of crazy, right? Except that, exactly, what did he say? At the same time he said, we're nearing, he didn't use these words, I don't remember the exact quote, we're nearing that red line for um, use of nuclear weapons if anyone attacks the Russian state, the Russian Russian territory. And if he's claimed it, then an attack, any attack, would suggest a trigger, right? That has, I find this, this is really the last two weeks, a really fascinating moment for a couple reasons. One, it was out there and everyone's saying, what the hell, what does it mean? Especially because, and what was it two weeks ago, six weeks ago? Um, because Immediately, Ukraine was taking area back in the north, right? Okay, so they don't have control over this, so what the hell does it mean? You start a nuclear war over territory you didn't control in the first place? Okay, 
A. B, these other countries started stepping in and saying, what do you mean? The best example, there was a little noticed article in the Financial Times, it was an editorial, I believe by a former lieutenant colonel of the Chinese army at Tsinghua University, which is a very important um, university affiliated with the Communist Party in China. It was an independent piece, like hell it was independent, okay? <laughs> and it said, if Putin makes use of nuclear weapons, these are the options open to China. And the options involve stepping back from supporting Putin, re-evaluating the entire relationship with Putin, re-evaluating trade with Putin. I took that to be a really stunning statement. Then it was echoed about a week and a half later uh, by Xi. I think that, I, I, I actually think, look, what am I? I'm a stupid historian. But the, after that, Putin's rhetoric about the nuclear, use of nuclear weapons over this annex territory went away. I think probably President Biden also said very quietly to him, these are the concrete measures we're going to take if you use nuclear weapons. And actually, the second part, I think, So that's a good question, and um, this is just my guess. The really sad thing about historians, let me tell you, is at the time we think we have special insight, and if we live long enough, 25 years later a book comes out and says, no, you got it all wrong. So I just want you all to know that I officially say, I, I probably got it all wrong. But I'm giving you, like I did with my students, what I think is the most plausible explanation of what's happening. Did you have one more question? Yeah. Let's talk about three scenarios. How long is it going to go on? Let's talk about catastrophic scenario for Ukraine. Somehow, the, you know, a bomb is dropped and it kills Zelensky and the major parts of the government, and they're without central control, and it falls into disorder. Is by the way, is that what Russia wants? How long will it go on? When will it end? According to U.S. Um, government um, or U.S. military. Estimates today, Ukraine has already lost 100,000 men, either killed or injured. It is 100% clear that Ukraine is not giving up. It doesn't matter, by the way, if our president or any president tells them to go to the negotiating table, they're not. And under Stalin, for more than five years, they resisted. I think you have a failed state and you have terrorism going on for maybe decades. That's the best case scenario for Russia, by the way. So again, what? This is a stupid war. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't see how it works. Second case, let's say best case scenario for Ukraine. They actually push back and push the Russians out, even of Crimea. It's unlikely, I think. But again, I'm thinking it's more likely than it was just a, a few months ago. Russia, whatever happens there, somehow they're not involved anymore. Okay, the war ends. Can any of you imagine The Ukrainians treating ethnic Russians nicely. And I'm not saying that, guys, there's a lot that's difficult in Ukraine. By the way, there was a lot that's difficult in Poland in 1939 that did not justify invasion. The same thing doesn't justify invasion. There's a lot of potential violence there. I don't think, the, I think that the problems in Ukraine are multiplied and there'll be violence in, in Ukraine for quite some time. There's no happy ending. I don't think they're trying to destroy the of Russia. 
I do think, though, they're trying to decapitate uh, Ukraine and decapitate, especially the people like the <coughs> educated people who are likely to become leaders. I think that's important. I think second, they're trying to get a lesson, and the third, I think that it's really important because these institutions, they are important. Ukraine was a forgotten country. Not, not rightly, it was forgotten, but the last 25 years has seen this incredible growth of culture of all kinds, including multicultural discussions, which are kind of hard to do in Eastern Europe because of the history of Eastern Europe. I think that, put it in a slightly different context, I do believe this was an attempt to destroy a good example. And you put it together with what has been really a, a vicious attack on real culture in Russia. Real culture in Russia has always been astounding and it's always been a problem for the regime, right? For hundreds of years now. This is a normal thing in Russia. But the attack on that really has to do also with historical memory. And um, that fits with me more than, than saying we're going to get rid of exactly these institutions. I think they would be happy to have the institutions doing what they think they ought to do before the Swan Lake and so on. Or that makes sense, yeah? But I think that, that's another good point. Yeah. You know, again, I, I'm guessing we will never know what Putin thinks. Well, we'll have to stop right here because we're already running a little bit behind. Uh, so if you'd like to on. meet a uh, professor, please come over after. But let's thank again. And <laughs>